Hi, this is Bill Dizek. This is SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation, Rotating Regions, Shape, Size, and Mesh. I'm a customer support engineer uh, for Flow Simulation. Thank you for joining me today. Today's agenda uh, will have a slight introduction, uh, specifically talking about rotating region versus uh, when to use the real wall motion, global versus local rotating regions, and then we'll discuss the rotating regions themselves, the approach, size, shape, mesh, boundary conditions. And at the end, uh, we'll do some result processing uh, tool uh, to show some examples for, uh, for that. OK, uh, in this example, it shows when the real wall option should be used. Um, both on the left and the right, you see a surface. Uh, it's actually a disk that's has some angular velocity applied to it. It's, it's a flat surface. It's not a typical blade like an impeller um, uh, or a fan blade that you would see on a typical fan. Uh, in this case, you would want to use the real wall option. If you look at the left-hand side here, you'll see that uh, I have a screenshot of the boundary condition command. This is in the flow simulation uh, feature manager tree. And within here, you can actually select um, the real wall icon. And when you select real wall, you'll have an option for wall motion. And there'll be a, a place where you can enter an angular velocity for that surface. So you select the surface, select real wall, and you put in angular velocity. And actually, this real wall option could be used for translation. Um, if you have translation. Uh, Sometimes people use this for when they're modeling the aerodynamics of a car or um, an airplane on, on the ground. It could show that the ground uh, is moving instead of the airplane. But in this case, um, what we want to do is we want to change the, uh, the default boundary condition, which is a no-slip boundary condition, um, which means that the velocity goes to zero, which on this surface it is not. It's actually moving. So we're telling the program that the velocity does not go to zero has described either angular velocity or in some cases a translational velocity. Okay, and there's actually a, another tutorial example here. It's called the textile machine. Um, this cone uh, and the shaft that it's connected to is rotating. So we actually apply a real wall, wall motion um, the same way we did in the last slide. Uh, you go to the feature manager tree, insert a boundary condition, select your surfaces, select the real wall icon, and then at the end, uh, at the bottom of the screen here on the lower left, you'll see the angular velocity that you can input. Okay. Uh, later on, when we're talking about rotating regions, a lot of times the impeller or the fan is connected to some shaft. You can actually use the real wall option. In fact, this is the better way to do it. Apply a angular velocity to the shaft and then use the local rotating region, which we'll talk about in a few slides coming up here, uh, for the actual uh, motion of the blades, the, uh, how the velocity vectors and pressure the blades. Okay, let's um, discuss a little bit about global versus rotating region for people who are not familiar with this. There's, there's two options, um, either in the general settings command or in the project wizard. Uh, for rotation. And the first one is the, uh, that we'll talk about is the global rotating. And this is actually where uh, the whole entire computational domain is rotating. Uh, this is uh, not a very common case. Uh, most common, uh, more common is the local region of rotation. Uh, but um, the global rotating, there may be uh, a few cases out there that, that you may run across where uh, people have the rotating and you would pick the global rotating uh, it, it's fairly simple uh, there's nothing extra you have to do uh, you just pick that option you enter right on the screen as soon as you pick it the angular velocity um, and then probably applying some type of uh, inlet outlet boundary condition and then you can run it there's no extra features you have to create um, there may have to be some extra mesh refinement done but uh, that's it, it's not as involving as the local region rotation that uh, we'll talk about next. 
Hey, so the local region of rotation is exactly how it sounds. It's not it's not where the whole computational domain is rotating. It's only a relatively um, smaller section is rotating and, and uh, everything else is affected by that rotation. So in that case, you want to pick the uh, local rotating option. And it's used. To, you can actually have multiple local rotating coordinate systems within your model. Um, all model parts and components within these regions are considered rotating by default. Um, and non-rotating components outside these regions are not required to be actually symmetrical. So that's one of the requirements. We'll, we'll talk about that in a few slides uh, coming up here. Um, here's some images. On the upper left-hand corner is an image of a global rotating. So this whole region is rotating. Um, in this case, it's in a clockwise direction. We have an inlet boundary condition. Um, and that's one of the requirements is that uh, the majority of the flow has to be down the axis of rotation. And then we have an outlet, which is around the radial uh, of this uh, spinning impeller. And so everything, uh, all the, uh, the fluid within this computational domain is rotating. You can see a, uh, a pressure plot here right next to it uh, showing the pressures. Now, the uh, on the right-hand side, upper right, and the lower center portion are two examples of a local rotating region. We have a fan blade and motor and blades uh, rotating here. Um, and the rest of the region is not rotating, but it is affected by the rotation. So uh, we want to use the local rotating region for this. And, and velocity vectors. Spinning of the blades is um, pulling the flow up and exiting out through the top. So we actually have environmental boundary conditions both at the top and to, at the bottom uh, to simulate that, uh, uh, that flow condition. And also the local rotating region here um, of this uh, processor, and you can actually see that there's a local region within here. Again, we have an inlet which is down the axis of rotation, and the outlet is right here, uh, environmental pressure condition. It's not uh, axisymmetric. So this is, the, this is perfectly fine to do something like this, as long as it's not within the local rotating region. It's outside the local rotating region. So uh, let's talk again a little bit about the global. Um, I showed you an image here before of the boundary conditions um, for this uh, impeller. So flows rotating and it's a centrifugal pump simulated with the global rotating reference frame option since all non-rotating components of the pump are axisymmetric with respect to the rotating axis. So the static pressure distribution in this midsection is shown below. So uh, this just gives you a little bit more detailed description of the global rotating axis. Um, in the axial fan condition, again, um, I mentioned that um, uh, we have an environmental boundary condition at the top and at the bottom. Notice that the conditions are the same. And that's, uh, that's very typical of a rotating flow problem. Um, these are suggestions for the flow. Uh, flow simulation will base the pressures within the model uh, on the angular rotating region and its effect on the uh, regions outside the local rotating region. And it'll calculate approximately the, the correct pressures and velocities throughout the whole computational domain. And we'll talk about this real wall stator condition later. Um, slides uh, from that. Okay, the centrifugal pump. Um, I showed you the image earlier. This pump uses a rotating impeller to increase the pressure of the fluid to move the fluid through the piping system. So we don't actually model the whole piping system. We're just modeling the centrifugal pump. The fluid enters the pump impeller near the rotation axis and accelerated by the um, rotating motion of the uh, uh, impeller blades. Uh, it's flowing radially outward in the volute chamber from where it exits into the piping system. Um, in a outlet. So the flow field at the boundaries of the rotating region and closing the impeller is not completely axisymmetric, but these deviations from the axial symmetry are relatively small. They do not influence the pump characteristic. The pressure velocity vectors are shown here on the right. Again, uh, we have an environmental pressure uh, at the inlet. Again, the inlet surface, uh, the flow is coming in axially 
uh, down the uh, rotation axis. Uh, we have an angular velocity applied to the local region, and we'll show how that's uh, applied in just a second. And we have an, an environmental pressure here at the outlet. Now, this environmental pressure here um, is actually higher than the inlet pressure. This is actually the operating pressure of the um, uh, of this pump design, and that's usually what's recommended. Uh, the pump designs, turbines, compressors run at a much higher pressure than ambient, and if you uh, use that as your outlet uh, pressure and also uh, assign environmental pressure. Uh, environmental pressure is the correct pressure in these conditions because it will, if there's any type of um, vorticity, uh, a vortex flow or flows coming back in through the outlet, which can occur on um, outlet designs, it treats the inlet flow rate as a mass flow rate, the part that's coming in through the outlet and the part that's leaving. Um, as a static pressure, which which is uh, which is the correct way of a static pressure in and a total. Uh, I'm sorry, a total pressure in and a static pressure out. Okay, so um, some prerequisites. The rotating reference frame approach has uh, the following prerequisites: the inlet flow field at the rotating reference frame boundaries must be axisymmetric with respect to the rotation axis. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. And I've mentioned that already. The outlet flow field at the rotating uh, boundaries must be as close to axisymmetric with respect to the rotation axis as possible. So this is the outlet flow field at the local rotating region boundary. The rotating reference frame boundaries are the computational domain outer boundaries for the global rotating option. Okay, so that's that goes without saying. And the rotating region outer surface for local rotating region options. So. Uh, we're specifically talking about the outlet of the uh, local rotating region, which is defined automatically in flow simulation. Um, you don't have to do that. They just have to supply the outlet condition of the system that they're uh, the whole computation of domain. Now, um, again, this is something that's done internally in flow simulation, but just so that you understand what's going on, each rotating solid component is surrounded by an axisymmetrical rotating region which has its own coordinate system rotating together with the component. So to connect the solutions obtained within the rotating region and in the non-rotating part of the computational domain, um, special internal boundary conditions are set automatically at the fluid boundaries of the rotating regions. So I'll explain that in the next slide. The rotating region's boundaries are sliced into rings of equal width, as shown on the right-hand side. And the values of the flow parameters are transferred as boundary conditions. This is done automatically in flow simulation from the adjacent fluid regions and are averaged circumferentially over each of these rings. This is an averaging technique, and this is why it's important um, that you have axisymmetric um, model blades within the model because your results can be affected. Um, you can do a time-dependent transient analysis, and sometimes it's recommended for certain cases. Um, and it's the way the time-dependent transient is handled. It actually uses a steady-state approach and average at the rotating reference frame boundaries. If you have gravitational effects as considered in the analysis, the rotational axis must be parallel to the gravity vector. And uh, just to get back to the time-dependent, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. Uh, in more detail. The rotating region option is not applicable for high Mach number flows. So uh, for steady state, we're talking about flows uh, around Mach 3 or higher. And, and uh, usually it's it's lower than that. It's it's about Mach 1 and, uh, and higher. Okay, so um, let's talk about the, uh, the rotating region approach, uh, specifically the local rotating region. It's defined by adding an additional SOLIDWORKS feature representing this local region surrounding the blades of the model and specifying the angular velocity. So, um, unlike the global, where you, you, don't, you don't have to do this, in, in fact, it's this good, but in the local rotating region, you have to define fluid volume around the rotating blades, just like here. So, um, the user has to create a SOLIDWORKS feature that is slightly uh, larger than the 
the, the envelope of the blades that's rotating. And it's important to be slightly larger so that at the tip of the blades, the correct velocity vectors and pressure are defined. And here in the lower left-hand corner, we're showing that uh, this is the component to apply the rotating region um, and how it fits within the uh, uh, over the blades. Now, after creating the SolidWorks feature, um, you need to disable the SolidWorks feature using the component control command. This is in the flow simulation drop-down menu. Or when you define um, the local rotating region in the flow simulation feature manager tree, um, there's actually an option box where it'll disable it for you automatically. That, that's in more of the newer versions of flow simulation. In the older versions, they didn't have that, so you have to go to the component control command to do it. Um, just because I've been in flow simulation for a long time, I still have the habit of going to the control and, and doing it myself. Hey, um, so that's all First, collect the rotating region in the flow simulation features toolbar or flow simulation um, wizard. So here we have a picture of the wizard. Uh, select the uh, rotating region here, and you have the choice of global and local. So this is in the project wizard where you define your internal external analysis and other options. In this case, we're just going to pick the rotation option. And since we have a local rotating region, we're going to select that. Now, in the flow simulation feature manager tree, when you uh, once this local rotating region option is selected and you finish the wizard and you close down the general settings command, a rotating region command appears in the, uh, the flow simulation feature manager tree. You select the insert rotating region and you select that component that's disabled. And here's that checkbox that I said that if, if you don't do it manually, using the uh, component control command, it will disable it for you uh, just by making sure that this box is checked. And then you specify your angular velocity. So you pick the component, you specify the angular velocity, um, and then your okay button, you're done for this particular command. Now, before we go any further, uh, just so that you, you kind of have a, 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 I've explained a physical sense of how the rotating region is, uh, is and, and I want to explain it a little bit numerically uh, for people who are a little bit familiar with the United Stokes equations and just in general so people understand how this is being calculated. Uh, the conservation laws for angular momentum and energy um, are in the Cartesian coordinate system rotating with the angular velocity about an axis passing through the coordinate system's origin. And, it's, and what, the first equation is the momentum equation as we see here. Now, there's an extra body force term added at the end of uh, the momentum equation. And I'll, I'll talk more about what this body force term is. So just so that you understand numerically, you're using the same equations, and the rotation is added by this body force term S that you see in the momentum equation. It's also added to the energy equation uh, so that you can do heat transfer analysis. So um, it's added uh, right here. Uh, again, in this another body, uh, body force term within the, uh, uh, the energy equation of the Navier-Stokes equations. Now this body force term is defined uh, by these uh, settings or, or these parameters here. And the omega is the actually the angular velocity that the solver uses from the user-defined input uh, in the rotating region and you can see that it's squared, so it's a, a very nonlinear term. Uh, in fact, all the equations are nonlinear, so that goes without saying. Um, and so it, it's a fairly complex calculation. And what's going on is within that local rotating region, it has this extra body force term to define the angular velocity at every cell. So these equations are solved within every cell within that local region. And builds this angular velocity. Now, or it's assigned the velocity outside the local rotating region. The Navier-Stokes momentum energy equation, if, uh, if it's required, is um, also solved, but it doesn't have this extra body force term. So it will it'll feel the, uh, the pressures and velocity effects of the local region, uh, but it doesn't have this extra term added uh, at the local rotating region. So why you have to set it up in the way you do it in global 
uh, rotating region, all of the cells within the computational domain have this extra body force term. Whereas in the local rotating region, only the, uh, the cells within the local region have it. Okay, so let's talk more a little bit about the approach. Um, okay, I already specified that you have to create a separate SOLIDWORKS feature for the local rotating region. So this component must be enclosed by the rotating component and the walls must not contact or intersect the rotating region um, boundaries. Okay, the rotating component must be actually symmetric. The rotating component's intersections with other fluid and solid regions must also be actually symmetric. If you have uh, more than one local rotating region, you have to make sure that they do not intersect each other because that can cause all kinds of solver uh, divergence issues. Uh, there must be some non-rotating cells in between uh, the two rotating regions. If that's not possible, then unfortunately, uh, flow simulators cannot solve a problem if the blades are not so close to each other that you cannot separate the local rotating regions. The next slide here, um, we're talking a little bit about, again, the size, shape, and mesh. So we must adjust the mesh settings to have at least two or three cells across the gaps between the rotating region boundary and the surface of the rotating component. Um, if the rotating model component is a body of revolution, use the moving wall boundary instead of the rotating. So that's, that's the real wall condition that was mentioned earlier. You can place rotating region boundary within a solid body instead of putting it into a narrow gap between the rotating component and the non-rotating component. This will allow you to reduce the possible negative influence of the flow disturbances within the narrow gap. So uh, they're specifically talking about this, these images. It's not right, the, uh, the orange box that you see here, the rectangle, is the local rotating region uh, that was created in the table. Now, if you notice, it's not recommended to have it end right here. Um, you have a small gap here that's non-rotating. And having this non-rotating with the extra body force term of rotating can cause a lot of uh, divergence issues. So it's recommended to create. It's okay um, to have interference with uh, the adjacent uh, solid wall. And what will happen is these surfaces, which are not rotating, will also be assigned the angular velocity. So I'll show you later where you actually apply an extra uh, real wall boundary condition called a stator condition, which tells flow simulation to set the velocities to zero along this surface over here since it's not rotating. Okay. And another option about the real wall, this is what I was talking about earlier regarding the shaft. If, if we had a shaft here, then wall boundary condition um, shaft is being used to rotate the blades. Okay, so um, just to recap again here, this is showing you the mesh and the uh, rotating regions, again, in the global um, in, in any type of uh, rotating, whether it's a global or local. Um, it's more of an intensive calculation than the other flow type problems. So uh, rotation problems usually require more cells, uh, total cells, which means you have more RAM. It also requires more uh, CPU to, uh, to solve, not just because um, there's more cells, but also it takes more iterations. In fact, it's not uncommon some uh, turbo pumps compressors to take two, three thousand or more iterations uh, to convert. So it's, it's much more difficult because of the extra body force term that you have in the equations. Uh, you have the model. But you can see that there's a nice fine mesh uh, within this global rotating region. In our other, uh, in, in another fan case, we have a rotating impeller system mounted on top of the heat sink. Um, I have some other pictures uh, that you'll see later in the presentation. Um, again, a rotating region was uh, uh, created uh, to fit around fins. You can see it here, and I, I have other images to go into more in depth on how this was created. Um, and you can see that the mesh, uh, there's a finer mesh inside here, uh, also along the heat sink fins. Now, you know, mesh is a very relative thing. 
depends on the type of level of accuracy. Unfortunately, it's a trial and error process. There, there is no, um, uh, so far, general rules of thumb. Um, it, it normally, what happens is what's called a grid convergence or a mesh convergence, which means that um, you run one mesh um, converge in a solution and then maybe uh, increase the refinement uh, either by doubling the size of, of the total number of cells within the local rotating region or within the, the whole model and see if the results change significantly. If they don't change, then you know that the original mesh uh, was fine, uh, didn't get good results, or, or, or at least based on a grid convergence um, standpoint. And if the results in the refined mesh is not very close to the original mesh, then you'll have to repeat the process, refine it again, rerun it again. The results are no longer significantly changing. All right, here's a um, an example of a fan blower. Um, this fan blower, you can see how the blades are on the outside, um, and they do not extend all the way to uh, the axis of rotation. Um, it's, it forms a ring. So um, the flow developers recommend a local rotating region that looks like at the center of the screen here. Um, again, you want to match the uh, impellers. Here is the mesh that was created for this particular design. This is a refined mesh around the impellers. You can see how the rotating region was larger than the impeller uh, blades. And you can see how um, it allows the program to calculate the velocities that are going around the tips and the edges of, of the blades. Um, if you create a, a solid rotating region, then um, chances are you may have some divergence solution. So that's why uh, this is the more recommended method. Okay, so um, we explained how flow simulation uses a circumferential averaging at the rotating region boundary. So for example, um, the mass flow rate that is going from the fan rotating region to the stator region is considered as an axisymmetric distribution. This type of axisymmetric mass flow just can produce unphysical pressure rises, pressure reaches. So when this flow is blocked by some non-symmetric obstacles, so if you have something sticking in the flow uh, in, in the local rotating region, that's, that's the body part term. Could produce some time dependent static pressure and mass flow oscillations that can't be captured by the current stationary rotating region. So, because of this averaging technique, um, it would cause some um, diver uh, divergence issues that unfortunately cannot be solved. So, these are one of the limitations of using this rotating region option. Okay, um, let's go back and talk a little bit more about the size and shape of the rotating region. Now, uh, on the right-hand side, this is actually one of our tutorial examples. Uh, the component to apply the rotating region must be a body of revolution, an axis of uh, and it's coincident with the rotating axis. So you don't want to create a rotating region that's a triangular triangle. You want to be able to do a rotate, uh, an angular or, or <laughs> um, um, kind of cylinder, kind of, kind of like a hockey puck. If, um, with that. When specifying the rotating region, make sure the surrounding components are also symmetric relative to the axis of revolution. This component must also be disabled, as I mentioned earlier. So, staying with this one example that we have, um, now since the flow on the boundary of the rotating region must be axisymmetric, users must provide a reasonable gap between the rotating boundary and the outer edges of the propeller to minimize the influence of local axisymmetric perturbations. So the direction of the flow at the rotating region boundary should also be taken account when defining the shape of the rotating region. Select the shape of the rotating region so that the flow direction will be as much perpendicular to the rotating region boundary as possible. Okay, so the picture below provides an additional insight into how the rotating shape was adapted to the geometry. 
Okay, so um, we have a heat sink fins here. We have a hot component. We have a fan blades that are rotating, pulling air down through the heat sink. Heat is being conducted through this copper core into this heat sink and directed away by um, the, the push of the air from the angular uh, velocities of the, uh, of the rotating impellers of the blades. Okay, now notice that the shape of this local rotating region has a little cutout section over here. And I'll show a cross section, another cross section in just a second. Now you can see that there was a reason why they eliminated this region, because it's really not going to affect the overall velocity, um, either, even in the local region around the blades. It could cause some divergence issues in the solver. So if you have some voids, it's okay to create a little notch to avoid getting divergence issues later on in the solver. And also in these little notches over here, uh, they actually cut out so that the rotating region would not intersect with this because it could also cause divergence uh, issues. So again, we're looking at that same model, the same image from the previous slide, um, and just pointing out that these gaps are necessary for flow to be more axisymmetric at the rotating region. By placing the rotating region boundary within the solid, instead of putting it into a narrow channel between the fan and the clip, which is this over here, we avoid the additional mesh refinement and the negative effects of non axisymmetric flow. So again, anything sticking into the local rotating region, we have to be very careful of what that looks like. So if, if there's a potential that could cause some uh, divergence issues, then it's okay to deviate the local rotating uh, region that you created in SolidWorks and disable uh, to avoid um, having any divergence issues later. Here, the rotating region boundary is placed within the solid to avoid unnecessary and non-realistic calculations of a swirled flow. This is in a little notch that I showed you at the center in the previous slide. The close cavity. This may yield inaccurate results. In the default direction of rotating speed, whenever you use the rotating region command in flow simulation, um, you'll see a green arrow. arrow points in the direction of the rotation, so it follows the right-hand roll where your thumb is pointing towards the arrow direction, and the curl of your fingers is the direction. So in this case, uh, we're going uh, anti-clockwise, counterclockwise uh, uh, with the blade motion. Now, if your blade is, is rotating in, uh, in this particular example, a clockwise rotation, then you, all you need to do is apply a negative sign the angular velocity uh, to flip that rotation. Okay, um, here's an example. This is actually one of the training examples that we have with the flow simulation. And this is a desktop fan that you would use um, in, in an office or um, classroom. Now, typically, um, people would model this as an external analysis, meaning that the, um, uh, the fan, uh, you would set up an external computational domain in the wizard, you would apply your uh, local rotating region around the fan blades and it run. But um, the problem is, is the far field pressure boundary conditions in the computational domain for an external analysis cause uh, some divergence issues uh, with the local rotating region. So it's recommended that you create a hollow cylinder as shown in the, uh, where my arrow is pointing uh, in the center here, and make this into an internal analysis. And that's recommended for any rotating flow problem. If, if you have an external situation, it's usually not in every single case, but in, in most cases, it's better uh, for convergence reasons to create an internal hollow cylinder and then apply pressure boundary conditions. In fact, to apply environmental pressure boundary conditions on all the surfaces of that external cylinder that you 
take the local rotating region um, and proceed as you normally would. This avoids a condition when the flow direction is tangent to the inlet boundary condition surface. So um, another thing is here, we mentioned how it's better if the flow is um, in the axis of rotation, okay? In the case of a table fan, some there is some flow coming in not quite um, in parallel with the axis of rotation. That's okay, as long as the main body of flow, which is in, in this particular case, um, the result should be fairly accurate, and it's okay to have some flow entering uh, through the sides of the local rotating region. And it, it, it does not seem to affect the, the results as long as the main. Now, an example where flow simulation, the, the local rotating region won't work, is with a vertical wind turbine. Flow simulation cannot model this type of design because the majority of the flow of a vertical wind tunnel, not a horizontal, but a vertical, is actually uh, coming in um, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And the uh, averaging technique used in flow simulation will have to be able to properly capture that situation. Okay, um, I mentioned early on about internal boundary conditions within the local rotating region, which is done automatically in flow simulation. And this explains a little bit um, how that works and why an outlet flow rate or rotational analysis is not recommended. Um, a lot of times people are setting up uh, turbines or compressors. They want to apply an outlet volume flow rate um, at the outlet of uh, whatever compressor or volute design that they have. And there's a couple of reasons. One, specific reason is because whenever you apply an outlet um, boundary condition on the surface, you're forcing the velocities constant at that surface, which is not the case. You have some type of velocity profile, and if you deviate from that velocity profile, you're affecting the results usually significantly. That's one reason. Now, another reason is what we're going to describe here. So that example that I gave you is really for many flow problems where it's usually recommended to apply an inlet flow rate in a pressure um, outlet boundary condition. The pressure will allow the velocity profile to develop naturally and the outlet will not change it. And that has to do with the way that the Stokes equations are set up for pretty much any computational flow dynamics program. Now, Usually, rotating region divides computational regions. So, <coughs> excuse me. This is automatic. It doesn't have to be used. It's not done by the user. Inlet region from the inlet section to the rotating region, the rotating region, and the outlet region from the rotating region up to the outlet section. So, in the inlet region, the boundary condition, inlet flow rate, outlet pressure is set. So, this is recommended for any rotating flow problem is either you have a, a pressure in, pressure out, uh, which is the next bullet slide, or an inlet flow rate in and an outlet pressure out. So in the rotating region boundary condition where the flow comes in, flow rate, where the flow goes out, pressure boundary condition. So either case, so you get a pressure in, pressure out, or inlet flow in, outlet pressure. Now, in the outlet region, because the flow goes out from the rotating region, the boundary condition flow rate is set. So if the outlet section boundary condition outlet flow rate is set, uh, we have the task in which we set an inlet and outlet flow rate. This type is incorrect. So if you, if you at the outlet of the local rotating region, um, automatically within flow simulation, there is a outlet flow rate condition applied to there. And if you have an outlet downstream, of your system, in this case, it would be the outlet of, uh, of this compressor type pump. And then you have two outlet conditions. And again, you have um, you won't have the correct velocity profile set at the outlet condition here. So to this condition, you need to apply an outlet pressure. So it's, it's very important that an outlet pressure. And like I said this earlier, this can be the operating pressure of the pump or turbine compressor design that you're using. And again, at the inlet, you can use an inlet flow rate or an environmental pressure 
So when users specify a rotating reference frame, they assume that all miles are rotated within the reference frame's angular velocity unless the user sets a specific wall to be stationary. And um, to specify a non-rotating wall, the stated real wall boundary condition can be used. If you remember earlier when I was showing the size of the local rotating region, it was recommended that you have an interference fit that you could go into the walls. But I mentioned how um, the uh, walls within um, pump design is not really rotating. It's, it's actually a real wall with zero, no slip, zero boundary condition. So if any wall that's within the local rotating region is not, that's not spinning, it's not rotating, um, has to have this stator condition. So this is in the boundary condition command. You can find it in the flow simulation feature manager tree. Select your uh, faces. Select the real wall option, real wall, and then you specify the stator. You, you don't want to specify any wall parameters, just the stator. So they have a zero velocity condition, which means that the boundary layer will be correctly calculated with the zero velocity at the wall. And note that the stator face must be actually symmetric because it's still within the local rotating region. Okay, there, um, in the boundary condition, sometimes people, uh, customers, want to apply an inlet flow rate that is relative to the rotating frame of X, uh, X is not the absolute. And um, by default, it's absolute, but users can select the relative rotating option um, and it'll treat the specified um, flow rate as equal to the absolute minus the angular velocity times this um, r which is the distance from the rotating axis in the angular velocity of the rotating frame okay so if the tangential velocity component is perpendicular to the opening's normal thus not influencing the mass flow rate within the opening coincides with the rotational axis. And the same with a pressure, specifying an environmental pressure instead of a flow rate. Select a pressure potential um, option. So what this does is just like the relative rotating frame, the pressure is based on the uh, relative rotating instead of the absolute pressure. So P absolute minus one half angular velocity squared times that R value again that's square. So the specified static pressure assumed to be pressure times the absolute reference frame minus one half angular squared R squared. Okay, um, I, I touched upon this earlier about convergence. Now the rotating flow problems usually require many more iterations to converge than the non-rotating. Rotating flow problems usually require longer CPU time, as I mentioned. And convergence issues requires patience, a lot of trial and error. And in this presentation, I tried to point out some examples, like the cutout in that CPU cooler design where the fan uh, had the center portion that was cut out, and around the uh, attachment clips, there was a little notch cut out. Now, um, convergence issues can be caused by many things improper rotating region, too coarse of a mass, small gap regions, boundary conditions, low flow rate. Now, low flow rate is when the volume rate through the fan is very sensitive to the fan pressure. High sensitivity, together with the explicit calculation procedure on the rotor stator interface, could produce some undamped flow rate oscillations. So, if you set some goals for pressure, velocity, um, you will actually see these oscillations in your convergence plot. And um, they're, they're going to look like a sine or a cosine wave. Work around this is to um, is the fixed mass or volume flow rate boundary condition pressure at the inlet. The main inconvenience of using the inlet flow rate. So remember, uh, I said that there's two sets of boundary conditions that are recommended. Um, one is uh, pressure pressure. Another one is a inlet flow rate and an outlet pressure. The main inconvenience of using the second one that I mentioned, the inlet flow rate outlet pressure uh, does not affect the pressure pressure so pressure in pressure out uh, you don't have to worry about this but the main inconvenience of using the inlet flow rate 
is that a user may not know the flow rate through the fan for a particular outlet pressure. As I mentioned, a lot of these turbines and compressors are capped for a much larger piping system. And um, usually people are guessing at what that outlet pressure is within the particular model, where, where they cut off the outlet uh, for the model that they're looking at. And this is very important for flow because any um, any region within the flow is influenced by upstream and downstream, and that's part of the nonlinearity, and that's why flow simulation is so difficult to calculate. Because this region of influence is large um, and, and very nonlinear. So the flow rate could be selected iteratively. For example, users can set some rough estimation of the flow rate and outlet pressure and perform a calculation. What does that mean? It means that after the calculation, users will obtain the inlet total pressure. Either use that, uh, a, a goal, surface goal, or the surface parameter command after it's done running. If this is lower than what is expected, the flow rate should be increased a bit. If it's higher, then the flow rate should be decreased. If the user changes the inlet flow rate, the user should continue the calculation. The solution will converge to a different inlet total pressure. After this step, users should repeat this procedure. After some iterations, users should be close to the necessary flow rate um, for that outlet pressure condition that required or um, exists. So possible other workaround suggestions include all or some of the following, and I've mentioned some of these already. Add an outlet section. Well, this part I did. Add an outlet section with environmental pressure. So people just, you know, in a piping system, Cut, cut off at a certain point, and they really don't know what the pressure is at that. Even if it is open to ambient, pressure right at that surface is not at ambient pressure because the velocity has some flow coming, and that velocity is affecting the pressure right at that outlet surface. And so um, what has to be done sometimes is to create an artificial, uh, just like we did for the table desk fan, we had to create a um, an external hollow cylinder to represent the ambient environment. At the outlet, you can actually this this could be rectangular because you're outside the local rotating region. Um, you can create a, a, a larger rectangular ambient at the outlet, um, and then apply environment remove the outlet lid or disable it, and apply an environmental ambient pressure or whatever pressure you want to set to all the surfaces in inside that box, um, that hollow box that you created downstream of the outlet. That's what they're talking about, an outlet section with environmental pressure. So all the surfaces within there. Change mess settings and the form of the rotating region. Uh, we showed that in the CPU example. Um, switch the task to transient mode with increased user-defined time steps. So um, you can change sometimes when you have oscillations if you define a time-dependent uh, instead of a steady state, um, is a much better solution because it, it, it's, it's a more natural solution for the solver. Use the method. Uh, the only downside to doing that is it may take longer to solve, especially for very large um, total uh, has a lot of, a lot of uh, small cells, refined cells. Total cell number is very large. CPU time to run will be increased over a steady state. Use the method with a fixed inlet volume flow rate as specified in just a few slides ago. After some time, you can determine the inlet flow rate that produces the inlet total pressure close to environmental pressure. Okay, um, we're going to discuss a little bit about the rotating region results processing tools. Um, this is on the right hand side, both top and bottom. We're looking at the typical velocity distribution. This is of the CPU cooler. Have a uh, rotating fan with some prescribed angle of velocity connected to a heat sink, trying to draw heat out, um, and the fan convects the uh, heat away from the component. And for here, we have a velocity distribution and contour plot. This is a front plane at the top, this is a right plane, and flow is coming, is being pulled in downward uh, by the rotation of the blades through the um, uh, curved heat sink fins that we have here. 
level. And also, um, see how the velocity vectors are highest at the contour plot uh, with the red, lower velocity, and it's being, um, the flow is being pushed through these curved heat sinks and then out through the uh, edges of the curved heat sink fence. And then in the right plane, um, you're seeing the same thing. Now you can actually see the computational or the local rotating region. And sometimes, sorry, I keep the, the wrong button here. Sometimes what happens is that um, you know, if you have a very high rate of rotation, you'll actually see a discontinuity between the local rotating region, which has that extra body force term and in cases that don't. Um, and this is inherent in the local rotating region. And unfortunately, there's, there's really nothing that can be done in these cases and uh, it does not affect the overall solution. It's just at those local regions. Even if you try to find mesh in those regions, uh, you may see some discontinuity. Now, um, the following parameters are available and the, the, there are some additional velocities, not just the normal velocities, but the, the axial velocity uh, option. And sometimes you have to click the more parameters button to find these. They're, they're not shown by default uh, when you go to cut plot options and it shows you which is a, that's actually a reduced place. If you pick on the more parameters, um, you can find these other options that I'll show you. There's the axial velocity, this is the fluid velocity component along the rotating coordinate system rotation axis. So it can be determined both in the rotating coordinate system and the absolute rotating system. And I'll, I'll talk about that later in a couple of slides. Circumferential velocity. This is the fluid velocity component along the rotating system's peripheral velocity vector relative to the z-axis of the selected absolute or non-rotating coordinate system. Okay, the uh, circumferential velocity, RRF. RRF stands for rotating reference frame. Just as it sounds, this is the fluid velocity component along the peripheral uh, velocity vector z-axis of the selected rotating component. Note that if the velocity is considered in the project in the form of a local rotating region, the values of this parameter outside the regions are determined in the absolute. So if you're using the circumferential uh, velocity in the rotating reference frame, then um, it will only be applied to the velocities within the local rotating region. Uh, obviously, this doesn't affect the velocities outside of the local in the non-rotating part. The velocity RRF, again, this is just the regular velocity command, but in the relative rotating frame uh, option, and it's, its velocity vector in the absolute value, again, only affects the local rotating region. Note that you may need to enable some of these parameters, like I said earlier, in the uh, settings or the more parameters. So just to show you an example on the left, uh, this is actually a, uh, a global rotating, looking at the velocity vectors, the, the normal velocity vectors are, you would normally see in the RRF, the rotating reference frame. So this is, you're looking at the velocity vectors as if you're an observer uh, standing uh, outside the computational domain, and you can see that the vectors are in the counterclockwise direction. Now, if you switch to the relative rotating reference, so you're now relative to the rotating reference frame. So it's as if you're actually sitting on the blades themselves, looking at the velocity vectors. And from your vantage point, from your relative vantage point, it looks like the vectors are going in the opposite direction than the um, the ones on the left. And so you will get vectors that are in the, um, in, in this case, clockwise direction for this example. If there is a peripheral velocity. It's the circumferential speed of the rotating coordinate system rotation, omega dot r. And this is where omega is the angular velocity and r is the radius of the point under consideration in the cylindrical coordinate system corresponding to the rotating system. So you have a number, number of extra options, but you kind of have to search for it uh, by selecting the, uh, uh, the more parameters option. Okay, and now the rotating region, um, you can either, as I've been showing you, do a cut plot, various cut plots, or you can actually use the surface plot command 
pressure along the surface. And, and a lot of times this is important for um, impeller designers uh, or people who work in the turbo machinery industry. They, they're interested in near the surfaces. And so you, you can actually do a surface plot instead of a cut plot. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. I hope this answered some questions that you may have and gets you a little bit more familiar with the rotating reference option, uh, both the global and the local rotating. Have a nice day, and uh, thank you again for attending.